for uh, what I call couch potatoes to those who are fitness buffs. It, we have, this whole building is Wi-Fi and internet connected and many of the equipment, much of the equipment is internet connected, meaning you'll have an incredible experience. Now, you've seen the commercial that talks about the president of the hair club. He says, I'm not only the president, but I, uh, I, I also use it. Now, he's got hair, so I'm not talking about that. Okay. <laughs> but I am the executive officer of the Opportunity Center, and um, I want to tell you that I do use our fitness center. I visited my physician yesterday, and since I've been using the equipment in here with the new center, I have lost 20 pounds. Oh. Yes. Two belt sizes. And I'm feeling a lot better. I'm 73 years old and I feel great. And a lot of that is because of our fitness director. So join me with a round of applause as I present to you uh, Sally Mainz, the fitness director of the Side. Thank you so much, Pastor Butcher. I am so excited. I'm not going to drag this out. All I want to do is just thank you all for being here today and supporting Bright's at Opportunity Center, our fitness center, and this entire facility. Um, I can't say anything more than wait till you hear this wonderful woman, Ernestine Shepard. She's over there waiting. Uh, what I'm going to pre say before she comes on, she is having her book coming out April 30th. And if you pre-order her book on her website, which I have paperwork here in cards, it will be a signed copy from Ernestine Shepard. Anyway, here we are. Would you want to come over here, Miss Ernestine? You're on. Thank you. I, I think I have a mic on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am really honored to be here to speak to you about my journey into fitness. But before I ever say anything, I have to let everyone know that I truly, truly love the Lord. And there isn't anything that I can do without him in my life. Wherever I go, I carry God with me at all times. Now, I have a creed that I live by, and I'd like to share that with you. I like to read it because I don't want to leave out not one word. And it goes this way. I promise myself to be strong that nothing, Nothing can disturb my peace of mind. To talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person that I meet. To make all of my friends feel that there is something worthwhile in them. To look at the sunny side of everything and make my optimism come true. To think only the best and to work only for the best, and to expect only the best, to be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as I am about my own, to forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future, to wear a cheerful expression at all times, and give a smile to every living creature that I meet. To give so much time to improve in myself that I have no time, absolutely no time at all to criticize others. And that is so important. To be too large to worry, too noble to anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble, to think well of myself, and to proclaim this fact to the world, not in loud words,
but in great deed. To live in the faith that the whole world is on my side, so long as I am true to the best that's in me. When my sister had given me this creed, of course, I wasn't doing any of this. But as my life kept going on and on, my life changed and I found out that I would follow this every day of my life. Now, my mantra is determined, dedicated, disciplined to be fit. And I wear that on all of my shirts all of the time, no matter where I go, I have this mantra on my shirt. And what I would like to say, when you start telling a story, all stories start once upon a time. Well, once upon a time, there was a world, and in that world were two sisters who loved each other dearly. If you saw one, you saw the other. That sister was so good to me, and we weren't doing any working out, we weren't doing anything, but it just so happened at age 56, and my sister was 57 at that time, we were invited to a church picnic. My husband was and still is the chairman of the trustee board at the church. He told us, he said, girls, you can come to the picnic and you can wear bathing suits. My sister and I hadn't been in a bathing suit in years. We went to purchase these suits we put them on. My sister turned and looked at me and started laughing. <laughs> and I couldn't figure why she was doing all this laughing. So I, in turn, looked at her. And I said, well, my goodness, you're not looking so good yourself. <laughs> she said, and she always called me Teeny. She says, Teeny, take that bathing suit off, leave it in the store. I said, well, you do the same thing. I said, you do the same thing, you leave that suit there. So we left the suits in the store. We went to the picnic and we heard some ladies, they were talking, saying they were going someplace to exercise. So my sister just eased over to find out where they were going. So. We found out within that next week, we went to this college. At the time, it was called Coppin College. We went to Coppin College, and we walked in, and the instructor was there, and he said, ladies, what can I do to help you? Well, my sister said, I want to get my body in shape. Can you help me? So he said, yes, I can. Well, I was always the big mouth out group. I walked in, I said, um, <clears throat> yeah, I want to get my body in shape, but you know what? I want to keep my big hips because um, I just love them being this big. He said, well, we don't do spot reducing around here. <laughs> so he said, I don't know whether I can help you, but I can help your sister. <laughs> my sister turned around and said, keep quiet. <laughs> and come on in here and work out. So we went in and we started by doing aerobics. We did that two days out of a week. However, I wasn't doing too much because I was lazy. But my sister was really working out. She was up front, she was on the front line. Guess who was on the back line? Me, because I wasn't doing anything. So finally the instructor said, you know, it would be nice if you ladies would start lifting weights. And I said, lift weights? My goodness, I don't want to look like a man. 
He said, you won't look like a man. You just come on and start lifting these weights. So again, I went in. I didn't do anything. My sister was in there. Her body changed. She was in the newspapers. She was on television. Guess who wasn't? <laughs> I had the audacity, again, to get angry and to get jealous because everybody was looking at her and no one was paying any attention to me. And I got angry and I had never walked far in my life. I got my bag and I walked home. And I said, I'm never coming back. My sister was the nicest person that you could ever meet. She came to the house. She said, if you want this joy, you had better start working out like I'm doing. I said, OK. So I went in, and I started working out. Then I had begun to notice a change in my body. So my sister said to me, you know what? What we want to do is to motivate and inspire other seniors to live a healthy, happy, positive, confident lifestyle by working out and by doing some type of cardio. So I said, OK. I went in and I started working out. I had begun making little speeches here and there. I wasn't good as she was. I was making little speeches here and there. One day, she came to me, and she said, if something were to happen to me, do you think that you could continue working out and get this word out to everybody? And I was always so silly. I said, well, vice versa. If something happens to me, will you do it? She says, I'm not fooling. Will you do it? So I said, yes. <laughs> Well, as time went on, she came to me one day and she said, I've had the worst headache. She said, my head is killing me. I don't know what's wrong. I said, well, maybe you have your braid too tight because she wore hair like this. <laughs> she said, no, I don't know what it is. And then the next time, she said, you know, I got up and I couldn't see out of one eye. And I couldn't imagine what was going on. I said, well, don't you think you need to go to the hospital? She says, no, I'll be all right. The next time, she said, it feels like water is running in my ears. I said, well, now it's really time to go to the hospital or to the doctor. She says, no, I'll just wait a little while longer. The next time when she called me, she said, I got up and didn't know who I was. I couldn't use my hands. I couldn't do anything. So I said, I'm coming home and take you to the hospital. My baby sister got there ahead of me. And she carried her to the hospital. By the time I got there, she was sitting in the waiting room. And I said, you've been waiting so long. Let's leave and go some other hospital, go to another hospital. She said, OK. We got in the car. She sat up and she looked at me. She says, now, I want to tell you something. I said, what is it that you want to tell me? Well, when we decided that we were going to try to inspire others to live a healthy lifestyle, we changed our names. She changed her name from Mildred to Velvet. <laughs> and she asked me, what would I change my name to? Well, I couldn't think of anything, so I just thought of a color. I said, well, I'm going to call myself Magenta. She said, you don't want to be called magenta. Let's just call you Ernie. I'll be velvet and you'll be Ernie. So that's what I went by. So in the car, she said to me, magenta, 
or Ernie, whichever one, you are going to have to stick to what you said. So I said, okay. She laid her head on my lap, and I looked at her, and I said, when you get well, I am going to tell you how you have worried me to no end. We got to the hospital. I said, let me get a wheelchair. She says, oh, no, you don't. I'm walking in. She walked in that hospital, and they asked her what was wrong, and she told them. <coughs> They took her back immediately and examined her. And I just knew that we wouldn't be there long. They examined her, and they came out and told my sister and me that my sister had a brain aneurysm and that it had already burst. When she was talking about water running in her ears, that was the blood from the aneurysm that had burst. By her not seeing out of one eye, all the different things that she mentioned, all of that came from the aneurysm. By her working out, she was stronger than the average person, so that kept her on her feet longer. She never wanted to be on life support. She had told me everything that she wanted done. She didn't want to be on life support. So she died right then and there. Mm. When she died, I stood there, and I looked, and I screamed and cried. And I said, now I don't have anyone. What am I going to do? My baby sister said, you have me. God bless her, I love my baby sister dearly. But that wasn't what I wanted at that moment. I ran around that hospital like a mad person. But I managed, when we had her funeral, she was cremated, I managed to sing <coughs> at her funeral the Lord's Prayer by Gates because she always liked to hear me sing. I signed that. We had the memorial service. <coughs> After that memorial service, I went home. I was the meanest, ugliest, nastiest person that you would ever, ever want to meet. And can I tell all of you that I also hated <coughs> God? Because I could not understand how God could take her away when in my mind there were people out here who were bad and he allowed them to live. And then I didn't have to go and check and say about other people. All I had to do was to take a look at myself because I wasn't such a good person. At a young age, believe it or not, do you know at five and at six years of age, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, I used to say <coughs> bad words all day long. <laughs> Where did I learn that? I don't know. But I enjoyed saying them. <laughs> and my sister would say to me, why do you talk like that? We were only a year apart. But I felt strong. I felt like I was tough by being able to say these words. And one day, I was walking through the square. And they had a sign that said, seated, keep off the grass. I looked down at that sign, and I looked up at her, and I'm not going to tell you the words that I used. I looked up at that sign, and then I looked up at her, and I said, I'm going to walk on this so-and-so grass. <laughs> and I mean, they were two bad words. I mean, really bad words. She said to me, as we were young, 
She said to me, something's going to change you one day. I don't know what it is, but something's going to change you. I said, I don't need to change because I'm happy just like I am. And I was a little kid talking that way. Well, as I said, I hated God. I went in the house. I ended up high blood pressure, panic attacks, depression. You name it, I had all of that. My husband couldn't even talk to me because I was mean. My son couldn't talk to me because I was mean. I just sat there and just sat there. And they knew me at the hospital because I had to keep going back and forth to the hospital to get some kind of nerve medication and something for, the dep for uh, panic attacks and whatever because it felt like the room was closing in on me. I was in misery. Well, one night, I went to bed, and I was asleep. And all of a sudden, believe this, my sister came to me in a dream, and she said, you are not doing what I asked you to do. Get up and do what I asked you to do. I didn't move right away, but within a couple of weeks or so, I decided that I would go to church. I didn't want to go. But my husband was happy that I put my clothes on and went to church. When I got in there, there was a song Velvet and I used to sing. And the words were, here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling through the night. I will go, Lord, where you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I stood up, something I had never done in my life. I stood up and I hollered, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of each new day. Give me back the love that I once had for you and never, ever let me slip away. When I did that, I disrupted the service. <laughs> but no one said anything to me. I actually disrupted that service. But don't you know, <laughs> I felt like a brand new person. If you've ever been touched by God, you'll know what I mean. I had changed completely. I made up my mind that I was going to be a better person and follow my sister's dream. I had a friend who took me to many bodybuilding shows. And he said to me, I'm going to take you to a show, and I want you to see what you think about this show. Because you had promised your sister that you would become a bodybuilder, and that the two of you would be in the Guinness Book of World Records, and you would also try to be in Ripley's Believe It or Not. So I went to this show. I had been working out, and I was dressed up. I was fresh anyway. I was dressed up, and I was sitting in the, in the seat, and this young man walked over to me, and he said to me, would you like to present trophies at my show? Well, I was so excited to do that. I said yes. I got up. He took me up on the stage, and when the participants had completed their workouts and whatever they were doing, I was able to give out the trophies. The young man who took me to give out the trophies is sitting somewhere over there, Yanni Shamberg. <laughs> that he thought I was already a bodybuilder. 
Well, then I got the bug. <laughs> I knew I wanted to do it after seeing everybody on the stage. So I went to him and I asked him, would he train me? He said he would. But I had to prove that I was going to do what he wanted. He said, the first thing that you're going to have to do is have Raymond Day take pictures of you in a swimsuit, and let me see what I'm going to have to be working with. <laughs> so Raymond Day took pictures and then sent them to Yanni Schamberger. He sent me a workout plan, and I did everything that he wanted me to do. So when he saw that my body had begun to change, he said, now you can come to my center and work out with me. So I went to his center. He said, you're going on a long, long journey. Are you ready to do it? I said, yes. But again, my mouth got started. <laughs> I said, I don't want to look like a man. <laughs> I don't want big muscles. He said, Ernie, you will not have big muscles. You will be toned. You will be the type, your body will be the type that when other ladies see you, they too will know that they can achieve the same thing. So, I started working out with him. Now, I thought I was working out before. <laughs> but imagine, working out with the former Mr. Universe was not a joke. I went to his center. When I worked out, he had me doing so many things. And I would look up at him and I'd say, you know I'm old. <laughs> you know I'm tired. You know I can't do this. And then I knew the next thing to say was, you know, because I have a job. I said, and you know I love you so much. I said, I really love you. He said, you're not old. He said, and I love you. But you said, would you want it? And in order to get this, you're going to have to work for it. So I did. Next thing, he said, you're now ready to do your first bodybuilding show. He took me to find out what type of suit I would wear. Well, this lady made these two suits. And I looked at him, I said, oh my god. What is my husband going to say when he sees me in a suit like this? Because he always sits in church with his hands folded and no nonsense, you know? And I had, you know, got myself back in. I was with, Lord, wasn't doing anything wrong, not saying any bad words, just being good. So anyway, I got there at the show. We practiced the poses and whatever and it was showtime. My music was more, more, more. How do you like it? How do you like it? <laughs> I was behind the curtain. I peeped out and there was my husband. <laughs> God bless him, his hands were folded and he was smiling. <laughs> and I looked up and I said, I can't do this. I can't go out. Yanni said, it is showtime. Oh, Lord have mercy. The music was playing more, more, more. Well, I had to come out more, more, more. How do you like it? How do you like it? Then I had to go like this. Then I had to go like this. Then I had to get down on my knees. And I had to go down. One, two, three. One, two, and then I had to do this to work the 
triceps. Well, I did all of that. Well, when that was over, I peeped. My husband's hands were still folded. <laughs> they were still folded. He was still smiling. So I said, well, I must not have done anything too badly. So after that show, what did I win, Yanni? What place did I come in? First place. <laughs> so proud of that and I smiled and I cried because I had finally done my first show and I knew I had done what my sister wanted I thought no more of it next thing I knew Yanni called me he said Ernie guess what Guinness Book of World Records the people there have called and said that they think you are the oldest female competitive bodybuilder in the world. I said, what? He said, now don't get too excited because I don't know. <laughs> Finally, he got the call back and they said I was. They said I had to come to Rome to get my certificate and my medal. I was so excited. Well. We left for Rome. I arrived in Rome March the 16th. That was my sister's birthday. When I got off the plane and they had a car waiting for us, I looked at the tag on that car. 316 was on that car, her birthday. Then when I got into the hotel, and I was standing in the lobby, and music was playing. They were playing one of her favorite songs. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. You know that song. And I stood there and the tears gushed in my eyes. And I said, she is here with me. She was cremated as I told you. I didn't let Yanni know that I carried some of my sister's ashes with me to Rome. Because if I had told him, he would have said no. I carried some of her ashes with me to Rome and when I had a free moment, I walked as far as I could and I spreaded her ashes. And I said, you are here with me. Then after that, we came back home. Don't you know, Yanni got another call. He got a call from Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> and they said that they wanted to put me in a book as Granny Six Packs. <laughs> <laughs> I was so thrilled about that <laughs> because my sister had said, that she wanted us to be in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Everything that she said, that is what I did. Then after that, we got so many other things that <coughs> happened. And most of the things that I have done, when I did the Skype with Oprah, 316, my sister's birthday, all of these things that I have done has been sometime near her birthday. I'll never, ever forget her. My other sister said, now you should set her free. I'll never set my sister free because I am absolutely nothing without her. And still, when I go out and purchase clothes, I buy two of the same outfits 
only in a different color because she and I dressed alike in different colors. So that's what I've been doing for the past 24 years. And I am absolutely nothing without all of you because all of you make me who I am. If you didn't love me, I wouldn't be standing here now. I am 80 years of age. I have more years behind me than I have in front of me. So what I have left, I want to help and motivate as many people as I can to live a healthy, happy, positive, confident lifestyle. Now, I've talked a lot. It's so much I can tell you, but I'm not going to tell too much because it's in this book. <laughs> but I'm open to any questions that you would want to ask me. Feel free to ask me anything. Is that OK? Yes, yes. OK. Yes, sir. What part of the diet plays in your regimen? Excuse me? What part does food and diet play in your regimen? OK. If you're working out, running, whatever you're doing, you have got to eat correctly. If you do not eat correctly, you'll never ever see any changes. You'll get stronger or something like that. But if you're looking for a change in your body, you do have to change your way of eating. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Don't be afraid to ask me anything. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When did you decide, decide to start running? When did I decide to start running? Okay. I was walking and running with my sister before she died. But when I ended up with depression, panic attacks, my baby sister told me, to lace up my sneakers and get out and start doing some type of cardio. And when you start doing that, it will take some of that depression away. I didn't believe it. But don't you know, when I started walking, all those pills and things that I was taking for depression, I don't take them anymore. Yeah. I don't take them. all of that other stuff. I was taking for high blood pressure. All of that left me from walking and running. And I try not to miss any time from going out to walk or run. Yes, ma'am. How have you seen the industry change over the years? Excuse me? How have you noticed the industry changing over the years? What? No, I didn't quite understand you. I've noticed quite a bit of changes since I started. And my trainer can definitely, where is he? He can definitely answer that. Uh, let them know how the fitness industry has changed. I always let him talk on that part. Well, what we have noticed is uh, more women are involved in weight training now. Somehow they realize that uh, weight training is not something that is bad for them. Right. Uh, and they're starting to train more with weights. Uh, a lot of gyms incorporate more training programs for women. Uh, I remember when I was starting to train, I was training in a gym where we may have two or three women that showed up. But now, most of the gyms are more women than men. Mm, so that's true. women are really catching on to working out. The sport has changed where we just had bodybuilding. Now we have so many more categories, and most of the extra categories are categories for women. So I think um, it's gotten broader. I think the base has increased, and I think it's a, a very good thing for everyone. Is Any? bodybuilding and strength training the same thing, no. or are they two separate things? You can, well, this is what I tell people. You can train in the gym every day, but until you get on stage and compete in a contest, you are not a bodybuilder. 
That's the difference. A bodybuilder will actually compete in a competition, and then you are now considered a bodybuilder. If you just lift weights and you have the body of a bodybuilder, you're just someone who loves weights, but you're not a bodybuilder until you compete. We'll take maybe two more questions. Okay, well, <laughs> here's how I eat. In the mornings, I will have a bowl of oatmeal. Then after I have my oatmeal, I will eat a tablespoonful of walnuts, a half a cup of uh, pineapples in its own juice, and then I drink my liquid egg whites, an eight ounce glass of liquid egg whites. As, oh, that's like Rocky. You know, I love Rocky. <laughs> then after that, I will have, I eat chicken, tuna fish, and turkey. I'll eat white potatoes, sweet potatoes, brown rice. These are things that I eat. Uh, frozen vegetables with no preservatives. I drink plenty of water. I eat five to six times a day. And my food is already prepared for me so that preparation is the key. So that with it being prepared, I won't eat anything that's not right because my dishes are in the refrigerator. And I put them in glass dishes, not the plastic dishes, so that I can heat them in the microwave. <laughs> yes. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. My first competition, I was 71 years of age. And it took Yanni Schamberger seven months to get me in shape to do that show. And I just love it, love it, love it. Mm -hmm. Is that it? One more question right here. Well, here's what I did. I, well, I normally weighed 145 pounds, okay? And I went from 145 pounds down to 116. So I stayed between 116 and 120. So that if now, or whatever, if I would have to do a bodybuilding show, I don't have to change my way of eating. I just do a little more cardio, and that keeps me in shape because I don't want to go from 145 back down and go back up to 145. I probably, I try to stay the same weight at all times. Mm -hmm. Well, we could just ask questions all day. <laughs> First off, I want you to give this wonderful, amazing woman a round of applause.